And uh, before I introduce our candidates, we have a beautiful flag behind us. And I would ask that Lee Morgan come up and lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have with us this morning an embarrassment of riches. We have two candidates for U.S. House, Ms. Anya Tino and Ms. Erica Reddick, and two candidates for U.S. Senate, Ms. Christina Nolan and Mr. Gerald Malloy. They will tell you a little bit more about themselves in their introductory comments, and I hope that you had a chance to meet them, and probably after we're done here, they'd be available for a few minutes, maybe, uh, to also uh, answer questions and talk with the crowd. So I'm really glad you're here. Let's get moving on this agenda. I couldn't have chosen a better moderator for this. Many of you know that Guy is the publisher and editor of Vermont Daily Chronicle. And if you have not signed up for it, it's an e-newsletter, the best coverage of what's going on at the State House you will ever find. Yep. So if you haven't, make sure you sign up for Vermont Daily Chronicle. Mr. Page, the floor is yours. Thank you, Wendy. Welcome all to the first 2022 GOP Congressional Candidate Forum. Our format will be questions on voting rights integrity, energy independence, <coughs> national debt, term limits, other national issues. We'll be taking, I'll be asking the one question of the Senate candidates and another on the sa another different question on the same topic to the House candidates and I'll be changing the order in which our, our candidates answer. So one will go first on the first question, another will go first on the, on the second one. Uh, please no interruptions from the crowd and also from the candidates. Each candidate will introduce themselves and make a two minute opening statement. Wendy Wilton is offered to be our timekeeper. She will give a a 10 or 15 second warning, at which point please wrap up. Uh, Anya Tino, would you please thank give you. your introduction? First of all, thank you to Guy and to Wendy. I know this was a lot of work putting it together and I appreciate it. Thank you for all of you showing up. My name is Anya Tino and I'm running for the U.S. House of Representatives for Vermont's only congressional seat in Washington, D.C. I'm running for this seat because I believe that we can have improvements, not just change. Improvements over change. And I know that I can be a strong voice for the state of Vermont in Washington and will do everything that I can to preserve the principles of liberty, which I value highly and I know everyone in this room also values very highly. I'm looking forward to this campaign, to getting the issues out in front of the voters. Uh, we have a very good chance as Republicans to claim a victory in this election because people have seen the damage that the leftist policies can do firsthand now. And it's important that we as Republicans capitalize on this so that we can show them that our policies are going to be the winning policies for our state and our nation. I am happy to answer questions at the end of this, if anybody has any for me, and I look forward to meeting all of you again, not just today, but further down the campaign trail. Thank you very much for coming. Erica. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here so early on a Saturday morning. I don't know about anybody else, but when I saw the time, I was like, ugh. <laughs> I gotta be on and functioning at 8.30 in the morning? This is a lot to ask. But it's, you know, kind of a test, right? Because once I get to Washington, there's not rest. You've got folks calling uh, for votes in the middle of the night, all times of the day. And so we really have to be prepared and ready to go at all times to make sure that we are fighting for liberty. So uh, I'm an accountant. I have a bachelor's degree in accounting from Champlain College. I was born and raised here in Vermont. And it's with that upbringing that I was taught determination, perseverance, hard work, 
responsibility and things like that. I tell people that when you have to chop wood to heat your house and when you have to uh, till the dirt in order to eat, you learn what it, you start to learn what it takes to be a part of society and what is required of you if you want to be successful. You can't just wait for things to come to you. You have to work for it and you have to strive. And that is those qualities, those character qualities that I learned growing up in this state are what I will bring to Washington with me because it's going to take determination, uh, perseverance, and, and things like that to be in the swamp and, and to, not get, to not get swept up in it. So what I promise to you is that I will go, I will fight for our personal liberties, I will fight for our freedom. I have goals like term limits for federal officials, a balanced budget and, um, and, and ways, things that we can do as, as congressional folks to rein in the power of the federal government and restore states' rights and, and restore the people to their proper place in the order of governance, which is at the top. Thank you. Christina. Thank you, Guy, and thank you, Wendy, and thank you all for being here this morning at 8.30 on a Saturday morning. I share Erica's sentiments about that. <laughs> um, I'm Christina Nolan. I've met many of you before. It's great to see some new faces. Um, I hope you're ready to win a U.S. Senate seat this year because this is the year and I'm going to get it done, and we cannot let this moment pass us by. 50 years that seat was held. Yeah. This, is, this is the year, this is a historic opportunity, and I have every intention of winning this race for you and for Vermonters and for the country. Who am I? Um, well, I'm a born and raised Vermonter. I grew up on a dirt road in Westford, not too far from here, called Woods Hollow Road, uh, in a working class family uh, of four kids. Uh, actually, there are seven kids in the family now because my parents got divorced and my dad had three more. So I'm the oldest of seven. Uh, my mom was a school teacher growing up, my dad was a carpenter. Um, uh, deep roots in Vermont. Um, I'm running for Senate for the same reasons I wanted to be U.S. Attorney and that is because I love this state. It's a blessing and a privilege to have been born here and raised here and to call myself a Vermonter. Um, and I want to give back to the state and I want to serve the state and there are too many things that are not going in the right direction. Inflation. 469 for gas on the way in here, I saw the sign. 459 was the cheaper stop. <laughs> Vermonters cannot uh, survive this, this level of inflation, tax on the middle class. Um, crime is on the rise. It, violent crime in Vermont is sharply on the rise. Overdose deaths on the rise. We have a crisis on the southern border. Um, nothing is going in the right direction. Workforce is left the workforce. Businesses can't stay open. Um, so if you like the way things are going, you can vote for Peter Welch, uh, who will be the Democratic nominee. He's been in Washington 15 years. He's been in politics for 40 years. He is not going to get the job done. Uh, if you want change, I propose that I'm your candidate um, and that we can turn things around and put this country in the right direction. Thank you. Gerald. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Guy, and thank you, everyone, for having this great event. So my name is Gerald Malloy, and I'm seeking to be your next United States Senator as a Republican. And I, I hope you can hear me in the back. Can you hear me? So I, I actually wanted to talk about that because I spoke last week at the uh, Teen Challenge in Johnson. It was a great event. I spoke for about 10 minutes, and afterwards, a couple of folks said, we couldn't hear you. I'm like, darn it. So I also realized then that I, I can't really squeeze in uh, my 42 years of experience and, and tell you all the things I've done in the military and in the government and the business and in Washington and my education and my family. So I, I put little cards out on, on every seat at www.deploymalloy.com. I'd ask if you please take a look at that to really learn about, learn about me and, and what, what I bring to the table to be a, to be a United States Senator. I, 42 years of service, character, experience, leadership, and performance. Uh, I only have about two minutes here. I'm going to be very straightforward. I think we have some time at the end, Guy. We have five minutes at the end, so I will present some of my, my thoughts and positions. Uh, I did want to ask a couple of quick questions. Uh, first, anybody better off than they were four years ago? Mm -hmm. No. I'm not. I know we're not clapping or anything now, but uh, how about uh, anybody excited about pro-life in here? Anybody pro-life? Yeah. All right. There you go. Uh, me too. Last one I wanted to say, is anybody excited about the red wave that's coming down the pike? Anybody excited about that? Yes. All right. I'm a combat veteran. We're in a battle. 
we're going to win. We're going to win and take over the, the Congress, and we're going to get our country back on track. So thank you very much. So for our, our first round of questions, will be on voting rights and integrity. I think we all agree that without sound elections, the rest of it almost doesn't matter. Responses to questions limited to two minutes each. We'll ask first the Senate. Uh, Christina, Congressman Peter Welch supported H.R. 1, which proposed federal control of elections. Would you have supported that bill? Why or why not? No, I would not have. We don't need federal control of elections. The Constitution contemplates that uh, the states will largely run elections. And each locality is different. Vermont is a rural state. The needs in Vermont and when it comes to our election laws may be different than a, a, a populated city, for example, or a more populated state. Um, I was the US attorney for Vermont. As US attorney, I was responsible for overseeing the enforcement uh, of free and fair elections and, making, and, and uh, preserving election integrity uh, for each election. I worked with all the other officials in the state to make sure we were ready to combat any form of fraud in elections, any form. None is OK. Uh, the franchise is the cornerstone of our country. Uh, the right to vote, uh, we aren't a country without it. Uh, so we need free and fair elections. As U.S. Attorney, we were able to make sure that there were no major issues um, in Vermont when it came to voting. And local control is working. We don't need a federal bureaucratic solution when local control is working. Um, so I would have voted no on that. Um, I would also note that 159 million people voted in the 2020 election. So we don't have a problem with people going, coming out to vote. I mean, people are voting, and that's great. And I applaud them. And I want everyone to vote. Uh, and I want every, all the, uh, I want them to vote in elections of integrity. And we're going to bring out new voters. I'm going to bring out new voters because I'm a different kind of candidate that presents a change from the status quo. And that is what Vermonters are looking for. So we want big voter turnout. And people are voting. And we don't need a federal bureaucratic solution forced onto every locality. Gerald, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I'm all set. Okay. Oh, my, go ahead. Okay, uh, my answer is no. Uh, number one on my platform is to return to abiding by the Constitution, to stop and protect Americans from un all unconstitutional mandates, executive orders, and initiatives such, such as this one. Uh, per the Constitution of the United States, elections are prescribed in each state and, and by the legislator, legislatures, excuse me, legislatures thereof. Uh, I would support state level actions like voter ID, opposing non-citizen voting, and removing statewide mail-in voting in favor of in-person voting. And going back to the 2020 elections, what concerns me greatly is the remaining perception that our, our, that our elections are not fair. Uh, what it's, uh, it, for instance, what it says in the uh, Vermont Constitution, pure. Uh, this is the foundation of our government, and I'm in favor of changes at the state level to remove that perception. Uh, I would look into possibly funding uh, for states to enable actions such as voter observers, possibly even making the election day a holiday uh, to reduce that perception. Thank you. Thank you, Senate candidates. Anya, do you support non-citizen voting? What three changes should be made to ensure the integrity of U.S. elections? So I do not support non-citizen voting. There are rights and privileges to being a citizen, and to fully enjoy the benefits of this country, you should be a citizen, and it should be the goal of immigrants to work towards and enjoy that fullness of our nation. To secure our elections, it's very simple. Voter ID, voter ID, voter ID. I can say that three times, but there are other things. We need to purge the voter rolls, and we need to be sure that we have poll watchers to make sure that the votes are being counted accurately as well. You can't go anywhere in this country and do anything without ID. I can't get a hotel room without an ID. You can't drive a car without ID. You can't fly on an airplane or get on a train without an ID. And I believe that it's the height of racism to state that we are unfairly treating minority communities by expecting that they have the basics of being 
functioning in our society. And I don't believe that it is true at all what the left's portray that we are suppressing votes with voter ID. I think that we are actually encouraging people <laughs> to feel secure in the election and to know that their vote will count. Thank you. Erica, would you like me to repeat the question? I'm upset, thank you. Um, I do not support non-citizen voting. Uh, one of the funny language tricks that people like to pull is that voting is a right in this country, and it is not. It is not one of the capital R rights uh, enumerated in the Constitution. It is a privilege of citizenship. And so that is one of the things that is really important to remember and not let the press mince words and, and confuse the topic. So if you are a citizen, you can vote. We can talk about voter ID and all of that other stuff, but it, it's really that simple. We shouldn't have to argue it. Um, as far as three changes that should be made to ensure uh, integrity of U.S. elections, number one is we need to actually enforce our voter laws. We saw twice during uh, town meeting day where our election laws were not followed. Uh, too much to get into in two minutes, but Alex Stith lost by two votes for Burlington City Council Ward 7, and he was not allowed the recounts that he was supposed to have access to. They sealed ballots before they were supposed to. It was a whole thing. We're not following our own election laws. Uh, Bur City of Burlington got found to have violated election law, and the Supreme Court said, well, too bad. So we need to actually start enforcing the laws that we have on the books. Uh, we need to do undo <coughs> illegal changes to our voter rules. The Secretary of State of Vermont does not have the right to decide how voting <coughs> procedures go. The legislature does that. So we need to undo all of the ways that our state legislature and everyone's state legislature has created illegal laws uh, to vote. Uh, the third and most important piece is that we all need to be involved. So if you're not a candidate, or helping a campaign or something like that, you need to be a poll watcher, you need to volunteer to help with election day, you need to run for inspector of elections, et cetera and so forth. There's no reason Democrats should be in charge of our elections. Thank you. Our next question is on energy independence. The first question is for the House. And Erica, I will ask you first. Does the Green New Deal embedded in recent legislation increase or decrease our reliance on foreign sources of energy or energy infrastructure? Um, this is so funny to me. Um, it clearly increases our reliance on foreign sources. So at the same time, we're going to call uh, Putin you know, a terrorist and all of these other things. At the same time as we're pulling troops out of Afghanistan and we're seeing the destruction uh, that we did in Iraq, all of these things, we're now gonna cut off our own, uh, our own production of oil and then ask for terrorists to sell us theirs and then be surprised when they're like, no. I, I, I mean, it is just unconscionable to me what this administration is doing, not only, not only in Washington, which is what we're here to talk about, but in Vermont with the clean heat standard, the, uh, oh my God, Global Warming Solutions Act, all of this stuff. These folks who are in charge, have, their only priority is the end goal, which is to end fossil fuels, okay? And so they do not care who they hurt or what they have to do to get to that end goal. And, and this is, they are not hiding the ball, you guys. They have said, Biden said, our, our Congress people have said, they want fossil fuels to be exorbitantly expensive so people feel the pain and are forced to switch. This is a, high gas prices are a feature, not a bug, okay? This is an absolutely a decision made by our administration, made by Congress. This isn't a mistake, it is on purpose. We cannot keep sending the same people back to Washington and expecting a different result. Thank you. Thank you. Gerald. Thank, Thank you. you uh, the same oh, I'm sorry. I, think on I beg hand. your pardon, I'm <laughs> jumping the gun. <laughs> I'm well, good. I don't need it repeated either. So yes, the Green New Deal would increase our dependence on foreign energy. It, it absolutely would. 
Um, I'll also add this. I drove past some very, very beautiful farmland coming in here, and it, was, it warmed my heart to see actual farms being used. Because on my side of the mountain, there are very few left, and it's sad to see the empty barns and the overgrown fields. But I do not believe that we should eliminate cattle to support the Green New Deal. I like beef, I like milk, and I like farming. Now, we have to focus also on the fact that we do not have an infrastructure in our country to support the Green New Deal's goals of zero carbon emissions. We cannot support all electric vehicles on the road. We do not have the infrastructure in place to do that. We cannot have everything go electric without major changes to the electrical grid. And to be depending on foreign sources for our energy, because that is what would happen, puts us in a national security situation where we would be unsafe. I also wish to point out that it is definitely a plan of the left to raise the cost of fossil fuels. We, we know this. Um, if you do any research at all, you know this. And we are looking at a summer of rising fuel prices, and what's worse, a winter of rising fuel prices. And there is no excuse for us not to be drilling for our own oil. It's also important to note that it, the wind towers that we see on the hills here haven't lowered the cost of energy for anyone in this room, hasn't lowered my cost of energy. And there's no actual way of containing that and saving that energy. It's only good for when it's in use. There, there is no way to save it. And that's why the state of Texas sued California because of those same principles. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies. For it's OK. <laughs> Moderator I would have spoke up eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so Gerald, uh, would you support the reopening of the Keystone Pipeline and restoration of energy policy of the previous administration to achieve energy independence? Uh, yes. My answer is yes. Uh, my second and third platform positions are promoting the opportunity for economic prosperity uh, sorry, uh, and ensuring the defense, security, and order of our country. On day one, the Biden administration uh, stopped Keystone Pipeline work, revoked permits, and started to implement barriers to the oil and gas industry. Uh, he has doubled down on that effort, uh, all in a crusade to kill an industry that 300 million Americans depend on, uh, just so he can push his new Green Deal. I would immediately seek to remove the barriers, and I've also proposed what I call a full reset, uh, like the entire world is doing right now, on future energy, climate, emissions, and, um, and environmental plans. I would look to establish plans and policies that take into account resources, infrastructure, and the actual cost and paying for implementation. Uh, and to consider at the end, what is the actual value of that, and most importantly, what do the American people really want? Uh, the Democratic Party has taken us from oil and gas independence, very reasonable prices, and an overall trade surplus to record gas prices and home oil at six fifty nine dollars a gallon. Uh, and, a, and a record trade deficit, and we've lost our oil and gas independence. Uh, right now, we could be booming with oil and gas trade around the world. Uh, it is without question uh, a matter of economic prosperity and defense security in order for the United States to regain oil and gas independence. Thank you. Christina. Yeah, so I called for canceling purchases of Russian oil um, and responsible American energy independence 10 days before President Biden came on board, or something like that. I was saying we've got to stop buying Russian oil as soon as Putin started using it as a weapon of war. Um, and, you're, and the gas prices, we need to remember, were up at a 40-year record high before Putin invaded Ukraine. That's right. But when you don't have uh, energy independence, you, put, you make yourself vulnerable to a bad actor cutting off the oil supply to the world. Um, so there's no question we need to pursue an all of the above approach to American energy independence. You see what's happening to these poor countries in Europe who were dependent on Putin for their uh, oil. They're in worse shape than we even are. So we absolutely cannot be uh, this idea that the Biden administration had to buy oil from uh, Venezuela 
we don't even recognize Maduro as the, as the uh, legitimate leader of Venezuela, but we're going to send them money and buy their oil? <laughs> I mean, when, when we can produce energy in this country, um, so I absolutely believe we need energy independence. If we ever had to purchase elsewhere, which we sometimes do, it should be from uh, our friends, like Canada. Some European countries are now buying from Australia. Um, but we should not be propping up places like Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, and Russia. Um, uh, and President Biden thought about doing that, too. Oh, we, don't, we can't, you know, gas prices are too high. Let's go buy from these tyrants, these people with abysmal human rights records who are antithetical to our American values. So absolutely all of the above approach to responsible American energy independence. Um, and I think we need leadership. I don't know where... Congressman Welch stands on that, doesn't really talk about it, but we need to start uh, speaking up and leading on these issues. And, the, and people cannot afford these gas prices. If we increased our supply of oil in this country, those prices would come down and give some relief to the middle class. Thank you. Our next round of questions is on national debt and inflation. First question to the Senate. Christina, you, you're up first. Okay. Was government overspending during COVID and after the prime source of the inflation our country is experiencing, currently experiencing at historic levels? I'm sorry, I'm going to rephrase that. Was government overspending during COVID and after the prime source of the inflation our country is currently experiencing at historic record levels? What measures should Congress take, if any, to regulate monetary policy through the Federal Reserve? Well, the truth is, both parties have been spending too much for too long. COVID was an unprecedented time. Perhaps there was some spending we needed to try. I'm sure that some of the bills were too big and that excess could have been cut from them. But it's very simple. Any student of history knows when, you, when the federal government spends too much money, you have record inflation like you're seeing right now. So it has to stop. It's, not, it's actually not hard to fix this problem. The, both parties need to stop spending so much money. They're not helping people. They're hurting people. When my parents got divorced, my mom could barely make her mortgage every month. And if the gas prices and the food prices were at that time uh, what they are right now, I think we would have lost the house. Four kids without a home. That's how serious this is. So the government needs to stop spending so much. Congressman Welch supported a $5 trillion spending bill in a time of record inflation, 40-year record inflation. Do you know how much that would have exacerbated the problem? And it was loaded with junk, you know, salmon studies off the coast of Washington State, you know, things that absolutely the American people did not need. I would not have supported that, that so-called Build Back Better bill. But um, very simply, the government has to stop spending so much money, and we need to pursue policies that put money in working families' pockets. Um, and, and anything we can do to do that right now, because they can't afford their groceries. Uh, the Thanksgiving Day turkey costs more, a lot more than it did uh, the year before. And I'm really worried about uh, the people who are just trying to make ends meet, let alone save some money for the future. They ought to be able to do that too. And they cannot do it with, the, with this draconian tax on the middle class that is inflation. We need to send a Republican to Washington, a common sense thinker to Washington, because we can, this problem can't get worse. It just can't get worse um, because working families and their children and their loved ones are not going to be able to stay afloat. Thank you. Gerald? Uh, yes. Uh, the main factor in inflation is overspending and contributing factors include executive orders designed to kill the oil and gas industry. These orders have caused uh, diesel at 6.43 a gallon and are imp also impacting food inflation, which is just going to get worse. Uh, inflation is largely due to the Democrat Party continuing to pursue, and as I mentioned, doubling down on unrealistic green policies, all at the expense of the American people. The solution is to stop, stop overspending, regain oil and, oil and gas independence, and a full reset to reasonable, realistic future energy plans. A noted economist Milton Friedman said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. I studied Mr. Friedman at West Point and while earning my MBA, his statement remains true. The Democrat Party's monetary policy, increasing what is called M2, the money supply, by 40% in 11 months uh, through what even Senator Manchin calls reckless overspending, 
uh, including 1.9 trillion for ARPA, 2.9 trillion more for the national debt, and pending overspending uh, under Build Back, Build Back Better, uh, including a giant $2.5 trillion tax hike, have all considered and will continue, have all can, uh, have and will continue to uh, cause inflation at 40 year highs in reduced purchasing power. The Fed finally started increasing interest rates and is selling off assets to reduce the money supply. That will, that will slow down the economy. We will likely soon enter a recession as the similarities, similarities between now and 1974 continue. The Federal Reserve Board reports to the Congress and submits its mon monetary policy. Congress sets the monetary policy. That is how Congress can regulate monetary policy. However, decisions on how to achieve those goals are made by the board. The Federal Reserve Board abandoned the congressional mandate uh, for price stability and zero inflation for a, tar uh, for a target of 2% inflation. Thank you. Question for the House. Anya, you're up first. What are the best solutions to curb the exploding national debt currently at 30 trillion? So I appreciate this question very much because we need to stop the government overspending. And it comes down to things that policies will correct this inflation. It, it is going to require voting in the House for a budget that is cut back on all of this excess money that is put into it. Things like the Green New Deal, it talks about climate change and all of that. It is a wish list of the left's spending. They, they have so much in there that is going to cost you money. The raising of taxes to pay for things that you're going to get no return on. You're not going to see any value from what they're spending money on. And government spending is the main cause of this inflation. We did have some unprecedented times with the pandemic, but it is not an excuse for how much money has been wasted in the two years since. And it's going to take tough decisions. It's going to take somebody who goes to Washington and says, no, I expect that each of these bills are going to be cut back to a reasonable amount of money so that we are not perpetuating this debt further and further down upon our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And I plan to do that in Washington. In Washington, I will be a voice for fiscal responsibility. I will stand up against overspending. And I believe fully that if we can get a majority of Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives, that as a group, we can stop the Democrats overspending. And I intend to be part of that. Thank you. Erica? Uh, so best solutions to curb, um, that is a, you know, an interesting adjective to choose. Uh, because the reality is uh, people are not going to like what will be required. Um, and it's, it really is just a matter of massive spending cuts. One of the things I will push for when I get to Washington is a balanced budget initiative. We're going to take the black card away from the federal government. No more debt spending. No more printing money and sending it to foreign countries to support them when we have something like 500,000 children in, in foster care in this country, okay? So we are not doing anyone a, a, a service by borrowing money, again, from countries that hate us. So we're buying oil from them and then we're also borrowing money. This is a massive national security threat. I'm trying to remember if you watch the debt clock, how much of what we owe is just in interest payments so some of the things I'm going to push for, um, and it may not seem related necessarily, but one topic, one bill, okay? If Congress wants to pass a bill, it has to have one topic in it. It needs to be very obvious to the American people what it's paying for, and it needs to be explicit what is being paid for. No more of these omnibus spending packages where nobody's read it, it's 10,000 pages long, and we're spending millions of dollars on the Kennedy Center. Okay, why are we, I don't know about you guys, I'm not going to the Kennedy Center. Do you have hundreds of dollars for a ticket? We're supplementing the wealthy in this country through bills that they write, that they have, that they have lobbyists write. Okay, so we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, we need to cut ties with big pharma. 
Oh, wow, that went so fast. Um, cut ties with big pharma. Um, and, and just generally cut spending across the board. That is the reality. I'm an accountant. I literally do this for a living. I help businesses on the verge of bankruptcy come back and make good financial decisions with their money, be good stewards of the resources that they've been given. And so that's what I'll do in Washington. Thank you. And before our break, we have one more question. It's the same question for all candidates. It's on term limits. Would you support term limits for members of Congress? And we'll go from my left to right here. Gerald, we'll start with you. Thank you. Yes, as a United States Senator, I will consider all interests of Vermonters, Vermont, and the United States. As term limits for Congress uh, are specified in the Constitution, it, it would require a constitutional amendment to change them. This were, would require two-thirds votes in both houses uh, or in, in state legislatures, and then ratification by three-fourths of states uh, or state legislatures. This, of course, would take time, and if I received a significant amount of interest from Vermonters to support changing term limits, I would seek to make an assessment of the viability of a change across Congress and pursue that interest. Conversely, if I observed uh, that there was a significant interest uh, for term limits changed within Congress, I would seek to determine the interest uh, from Vermonters. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So this is one of those issues where I can really see both sides of it, and I hope that's okay to say that. Um, and it's one of those issues where I'm going around talking to people and listening, um, and I can understand why pe there would be appeal to term limits. On balance, where I come down right now is that we should limit terms through elections. For example, somebody who's been in politics for 40 years and in Washington for 15 years, I think we should limit his term by voting in a new generation of leadership. I'm asking it uh, to be me. Um, but I think we need a new generation of leadership with fresh perspective, new energy, who understands the Vermont values of common sense and hard work. So I think we need to get out to vote. We need to talk to our friends. We need to spread the word. And we need to have a, a change in, in leadership through elections. So that's where I come down on it. I don't think we need a 75-year-old junior senator. Um, <laughs> and, and you know what? There's, there's nothing in the world wrong with being 75 years old, it's, uh, but, but, but there is something wrong with it if you've been there forever and you haven't gotten a darn thing done and you're a rubber stamp for the AOC Pelosi wing of the party. Um, and that's what we're talking about here. And uh, Congressman Welch cannot build seniority. Um, if you elect me, uh, I can be that new generation of leadership, that new way of thinking. Um, I can bring new energy to Washington, and I can build some seniority. That doesn't mean I need to stay forever, but you know what happens when you build seniority? You can get things like funding for the police. We need to fund the, the police desperately right now in Vermont. Um, uh, get things like technology and body armor to them and funding for new, uh, uh, new positions. Um, so these, these are the benefits of being able to you know, vote someone back if they're getting it done for your state. If they're not, they gotta go. So that's where I come down on it now, but I'm happy to keep having this conversation. Thank you. Erica. I am very much in favor of term limits for all federal officials, not just Congress. So just like has already been said, our congressional uh, representation should not have been there for this long. It is absolute nonsense. Uh, gridlock is a feature of our system, not a bug. I'm using that twice in, in one debate. But there is supposed to be gridlock in Washington. They're not supposed to be able to do this much. They are not supposed to have this much control over our lives. They are not supposed to have seniority where they can take money from places like Florida and Texas and give it to Vermont because we make bad decisions with the resources that we have been given by God, okay? There is no reason Vermont should be poor and be a receiver state. We have all of the resources that we could possibly want to be well off and to take care of our people, but we make poor decisions here and then we obfuscate responsibility to the rest of the country to take care of us. That is absolutely wrong. Anthony Fauci, why was he head of the NIH for 50 years? Are you joking right now? This man clearly showed that he was incompetent back during the AIDS epidemic. And then 40 years later, he, 30 years later, he's still there. That is absolutely wrong. 
all federal officials should have term limits, period. Um, we can argue about what those term limits should be. The president already has two, which is eight years, given the Senate is a six-year term. I think 12 years is plenty for anybody to be there. If you're there longer, it's because you want to make money or you're doing something. And and I and I you know I'm I'm very I, I'm very libertarian leaning and I get pushback from my libertarian friends for this but the reality is people will just let the same person stay there forever, okay? We want to have free choice, we want to have freedom, but human beings tend towards the tyranny of a king, and that's why we just reelect the same people over and over and over again without putting in the effort to choose something new. Thank you, Anya. So I struggle with term limits for the simple reason that I'm an extreme constitutionalist and it isn't in the Constitution. However, I recognize that unfortunately we have people that are abusing that and staying there for 40 to 50 years. And I would look into a constitutional amendment to adding term limits. However, I think that we could also balance the field by limiting what is able to be spent on a political campaign by a candidate, because that's really what goes wrong. They gather so much in their war chest, so to speak, when they've been there that long, that the up and coming candidate doesn't really have a chance to fight that. And if it was a limited amount that can be spent on a political campaign, that would level the playing field and allow both candidates to have a fair shot at winning that election. So that is my answer. It's kind of a tricky one. I think that we do need to do something to limit the amount of damage that has been done by certain individuals over the course of 50 years or more. Um, and unfortunately, what we're looking at now is that career politicians are not in touch with the state that they represent anymore. And that didn't used to be the case. When they wrote the Constitution, you had people, they were maybe 35 years old, they were going to go down there, they were going to do their job, they weren't going to stay that length of time. Frankly, people just didn't live that long back then. <laughs> so we do have to make a change now. We have to look at making a change now. And I will take that very seriously. I, I will tell you, I don't intend on staying in one seat for the rest of my life. Like, I, I just don't. I have other things to do when I'm done fixing this country. So I will, <laughs> I will be moving on within a reasonable length of time. Whether that means a different seat or just going to retire on a ranch somewhere, I will let you know. But I don't intend on doing that to you. <laughs> well, thank you. Welcome back for round two. We'll be using the same format as, as last time. Our next question is about the southern border. We'll ask the House first. Erica, I'll ask you to go first on this. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being most important, how do you rank the crisis at the southern border and why? Uh, our crisis at the southern border is absolutely number one. A, a number one. It is one of the most important national security issues that we are facing today. Um, talk, speak louder. Uh, it is one of the most important issues that we are facing in our national national security. Not just the southern border, but our border with Canada. That affects us even more, particularly here in Vermont. So the same fentanyl that is being trafficked across our southern border, the same human beings that are being sex trafficked and slave trafficked over our southern border are also coming across our border with Canada. And so I knew that we had a crisis with our borders long before Donald Trump came down the golden escalator. Uh, my nephew is a border patrol agent in South Texas, and he has shared personally the stories of seeing uh, folks, so there's a very porous border in Texas, okay? You, if you're on a border town, people cross the border to go to work, to go to school. It's very much uh, one community whether there's a border there or not. So you've got folks waiting in line to come to the, to cross the border to go to school, go to work, do whatever, just being slaughtered by cartels, just mowed down, okay? And that hundreds of people, innocent women and children, and that's been happening for decades. That is not new. 
But when we see the highest increase in drug overdose deaths in this country, and that hit Vermont the hardest, given that we have the highest rate of drug abuse in this country, we cannot, we cannot minimize in any way just how badly the southern border is being dealt with. We need to enforce our laws. That, God, two minutes is not very long. Okay. Wrap it up with a sentence. Anya. So border security is number one. It's a number one priority. It is a humanitarian and national security crisis, and combined it has created a very detrimental situation for our country. Um, when I talk about border security, I'm talking about northern and southern border. I don't really differentiate between the two because both of them need to be secured in order to maintain the sovereignty of our nation. We have drug problems coming over the border. We have human trafficking. We also have bad actors as far as terrorism is concerned, uh, foreign nationals that would mean this country harm, spying, etc. All of these things have to be taken into consideration. And I believe that we were on the right track when we were building a border wall. And I will support that when I go to Washington. I would support continuing to build the wall. For goodness sake, most of it's already paid for and it's just sitting there and Biden won't let them put it up. We need legislation that insists that that wall is finished because the people in Texas and Arizona and New Mexico and California need that additional help in stemming this tide of violent crime, frankly, diseases that they are unaware of the origins of. And the, it is unfair to tell the refugees that are coming to this border that they are going to be welcomed in and just have everything handed to them without any form of legal citizenship, legal processing, because they are coming and then they are suffering once they get there, because that's not the reality, not just in America, but anywhere in the world. No country in the world would allow this to happen, and they don't. And we need to be able to stand firm and stand strong and say no, and the wall helps us to do that. And it will also help us to help the people that are coming in to be processed correctly, to not have these weights in the cape is and so forth, et cetera. So uh, that is what I would support in Washington. Thank you. Thank you. Christina, <clears throat> it has been said that crisis on the southern border makes every state a border state. Do you agree? And what needs to be done to solve the problems there? I absolutely agree. The fentanyl that is pouring over the border in the quantities the likes of which we have never seen before, thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds, more last year uh, than any year on record. That is what, by and large, most of it, most of the 210 lives that we lost in Vermont in 2021 to overdose death was due to fentanyl. And it's almost all coming from Mexico. There are problems on the northern border, which I hope I can get to, but most of that fentanyl is coming from Mexico. And you better believe that fentanyl uh, is destroying Vermont lives, communities. It's taking Vermont lives. It's hurting our economy because people are becoming addicted and they can't work. Um, so Vermont is absolutely a border state because we had the highest increase in overdose deaths in Vermont, uh, the fastest percentage increase of anywhere in the country in the last couple of years. So nobody uh, more than Vermonters is feeling uh, the pain and the loss of life from the disaster that's going on on the border. And it's not just fentanyl. Um, it's human trafficking. Um, there are uh, uh, cartels that are making huge profits out of smuggling people over illegally and putting them at risk as they cross the desert in the heat and they can die doing that. So when, and, and I would not lift Title 42. Um, even the Democrats understand that's a terrible idea. It's another irresponsible move by the administration. We need that tool in place so that Border Patrol can efficiently send people who are coming illegally back and then focus their efforts on interdicting the fentanyl that is killing Americans and Vermonters and the pain is being particularly felt in Vermont. We also had 23 terrorists identified uh, trying to cross the southern border last year. Those are just the ones they caught. Yeah. Border Patrol is so distracted with the chaos and crisis that they don't even, that they don't have time, uh, that, that uh, they aren't even catching all the terrorists. The northern border is another issue. There are terrorist communities in Canada. Um, Vermont is a uh, highly trafficked place of passage. As U.S. Attorney, I increased charges on the northern border and we slowed down that illegal, illegal traffic in Vermont. 
but the radicalized populations in Canada, we got to keep an eye on this. We don't want them coming to America via Vermont. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, I have worked directly with U.S. government organizations for many years uh, across the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Department of Defense, and with many elements of the law enforcement community. Going back to 2007, the general consensus among elements of those organizations that dealt with the southern border and in my direct communications with senior U.S. government officials, and I'm talking about people like the drug czar, was that we needed a wall on our southern border, that the illegal Im immigration and smuggling of drugs into the United States was out of control. That was 15 years ago. So I am fully in favor of putting up a wall, the wall that was paused in another misguided day one executive order uh, to reduce illegal Im immigration and the opioid crime and economic impacts. I'm also in favor of extending the provisions of Title 42 as removing them later this month will result in further loss of control of our border. The Southwest, Southwest land borders encounters by Customs and Border Protection was over 220,000 in March. In 2021, over 11,000 pounds of fentanyl were seized by the CBP. I did the math. That is enough to kill over 2 billion people. Okay? China is the main producer, and most is coming in through, through Mexico. I believe China is waging chemical warfare against the United States with the synthetic opioid. I will seek to increase U.S. and international sanctions. If our trade with China went from $2 trillion down to $500 billion a year until the fentanyl stopped, it would dramatically decrease. Every, every state is a border state because the drug overdoses killed over 100,000 Americans last year, including right here in Vermont. I would also be interested in increased northern border security. Thank you. Thank you. Next set of questions. The question is on Second Amendment rights. This is for all candidates. Given recent increase of incidents involving the criminal misuse of a firearm, what, if any, new gun control laws would you propose or support? And Anya, we'll start with you. So I don't support any new restrictive gun laws. I believe the law-abiding gun owners should stop being punished for what criminals do, and criminals will continue to get weapons whether or not we are suspended from having them. It just puts us at greater danger. I frankly would like to see the nation return to constitutional carry. I think that that would be the biggest deterrent for gun crimes there is. If every citizen out there was able to carry a weapon to protect themselves and others, I think that would be a deterrent. I would also like to see reciprocity for legal gun ownership across state lines. Right now, I can't take my firearm and cross the state of New York without getting a certain permit if I want to go to, let's say, Ohio, where I'd be allowed to carry it. So we need to work on correcting the gun laws that are currently on the books to stop punishing law-abiding Vermonters, law-abiding citizens in our state and nation. And frankly, we need to look at why politicians want to disarm the public. This Constitution and the Second Amendment states clearly that gun ownership is necessary to preserve freedom, and anybody who is trying to take that right away from us has something bad in mind for us. And I think that we can look at the situation in Ukraine and see how valuable gun ownership has been to the citizens of Ukraine in protecting their homes and their families from Russian invasion. I think that all of these things are necessary to look at when we talk about gun control, and I will never support new restrictive gun laws. Thank you. Erica? Uh, thank you for the question. I also would not support any new gun laws. Um, every state, every city where you see the most restrictive gun laws, you have the worst gun crime. So we're not, these gun laws do not take guns out of the hands of criminals. It does not prevent suicides. It does not do any of that stuff. What it does is it just increases people's risk of being a victim. Um, anybody who lives in a rural area knows that there are not cops around to come save you. And if, you, and if you're in a city like Burlington, also the cops are not gonna come save you because city council defunded them. So you are left on your own to protect yourself. And that is how our constitution was written. You have the right 
to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then they enumerate that you have the right to protect all of those things. Okay? The Second Amendment was put in place to protect the first, period. Full stop. So what I would do um, is I would probably try to undo some gun laws. I know I'm not running for Vermont, but Lord, if I was, I'd be undoing the gun laws that have been passed the last few years. They don't make us safer. They don't make us better off. Uh, they just don't work. And that's the reality. Uh, we can try to legislate the ugliness and the hate out of the human heart. Uh, but to my knowledge, that has not yet been successful anywhere with anything that we have tried to do that with. And so infringing on the rights of, of law-abiding citizens is not something that I will be willing to do as your congressperson. Thank you. Christina. Yeah, so I am not for any new gun laws. No new gun laws, plain and simple. Um, we need to use the existing laws that are on the books to take guns out of the hands of criminals who are wreaking havoc in our communities. And yes, violent crime is very much on the rise. I live in Burlington. Over the last two years, the increase in the number of shootings ha has been just so disturbing and scary. Um, you don't know when shots are going to be fired in Burlington. <clears throat> so we need to use the existing gun laws like I did as U.S. Attorney. We had operations where we seized 128 guns and 6,000 rounds of ammunition illegally possessed. But the way to balance the Bill of Rights with public safety is to dust off the books, enforce the gun laws on the books, but not take guns out of the hands of the law abiding. We have one of our richest and most beautiful traditions in Vermont, I come from, is, is gun ownership, responsible gun ownership by the law abiding. For purposes of hunting, I come from a hunting family, target shooting, and yes, self-defense. I'm a gun owner myself, and, and the reason is self-defense. Um, so we also need to fund the police. That will help uh, with, with the rise in violent crime. Since they've been defunded, we've seen a spike in the wrong direction in violent crime and overdose deaths. Peter Welch voted three times to defund the police. That alone is disqualifying for, mm -hmm. for a position of leadership of, mm -hmm. of the significance he's seeking three different times in three different ways. I also want to say guns are illegally trafficked over the border. This also comes back to border security. You can ask anyone in Border Patrol in Vermont, when I was U.S. Attorney, I, was, I had the closest relationship with Border Patrol. When I left the office, they flew the flag with my name outside the Border Patrol station. They did, and it was, it was the honor of my life, and I have it framed in my house, uh, the flag that Border Patrol fl uh, flew for me. So we need to fund the Border Patrol, and how do we secure the border? We listen to the experts. You know who the experts are? Border Patrol. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chair. I do not support any new gun control laws. Uh, I believe that the increase in criminal mis misuse of a firearm is direct re directly related to misguided actions to defund the police, not being fully supportive of our law enforcement community, and, as Congressman Mulch sought, to change the qualified immunity of police. The result has been an increase in crime across the country, and there are some cities across America that have effectively lost control based on misguided knee-jerk reactions. I fully support funding the police with no changes to qualified immunity. If we go back to supporting our law enforcement commu community, we will see a decrease in com criminal activity. I would also add, add that my oldest son is uh, going to graduate from college later this year, and he is going to become a police officer, and I'm very proud of him for that. Thank you. Now a question about First Amendment. For the Senate, Gerald, we'll start with you. Has big tech curtailed free speech? How can the U.S. ensure First Amendment rights are respected in our time? Ready? Uh, yes, big tech has curtailed uh, free speech, banning a president, removal, and shadow banning are prime examples. Here is my answer on how to ensure First Amendment rights are respected. I was in Washington, D.C., in the Washington, D.C. area on January 6th last year, and I intended to attend the Trump rally. I was going to exercise my rights as a United States citizen under the First Amendment of the Constitution for freedom of speech, to assemble, to assemble peaceably, and to petition the government. 
I am aware of these rights because I have served in the United States Army as a commissioned officer for over two decades under the exact same oath that a United States Senator takes to support and, def to support and defend the Constitution, to bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the same, so help me God. I had no intentions of committing a crime or breaking any law that day. I just wanted to exercise my rights. Unfortunately, due to work, I was not able to get to, D to the rally to in D.C. that day. On that day, thousands and thousands of United States citizens exercised their rights to free speech, to assemble peaceably, and to petition the government without committing any kind of crime or breaking any law. I would like to read a quote from my Republican opponent regarding that day, January 6th, from the NBC5 published interview. I quote, I said that I would prosecute, as when I was a U.S. attorney, I would prosecute anyone involved in the events of that day, which were just tragic. So my answer to ensure First Amendment rights are respected is to elect a U.S. Senator that will abide by the oath of office and that respects the constitutional rights of every citizen. Thank you. Christina. Yeah, so um, go to my Twitter account and, and listen to that whole NBC5 interview, because what I was talking about were the people who broke into the Capitol, not the people who were protesting peacefully. Very simply, peaceful protests and exercise of First Amendment rights, no matter your point of view, uh, we should encourage and we should protect. I don't care what millionaire or billionaire owns the company, every point of view should be able to express themselves. There is never an excuse for violence. I don't care what your view is on either side, whether it's rioting in Minneapolis and burning the city down. Don't care how upset you are. A violence against the Capitol is not justified. I am for peaceful exercise of First Amendment rights. That's what, what I was talking about uh, in the interview that he's referring to, which I hope you'll go and watch on my Twitter account. I was referring to the people who broke into the Capitol, not the peaceful protesters. Of course, I took an oath as U.S. attorney to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I took that same oath he's talking about. I understand that the First Amendment is the First Amendment for a reason. It's the most important one. Um, and we, uh, any student of history knows that the answer for speech you don't like is what we're doing right now. It's, it's more speech. So if you disagree with something, say so. Um, and no, nobody should be censored. And uh, nobody should be uh, prohibited from peaceful protest. It's one of the most important uh, uh, traditions in our country. But violence, violence is never justified. Thank you. Um, House candidates, starting with you, Anya. Would you support repeal of Section 230, which shields big tech from liability? Yes, I would. I absolutely would, and big tech for far too long has been allowed to dictate to the masses what content they're allowed to see, what opinion they're allowed to hear, and they have undoubtedly engaged in shadow banning against conservatives, and they have also created an atmosphere on their platforms where conservative voices are ridiculed and really held... Um, really lied about, if, if you want to go to the simplest terms. When big tech decided that they could silence a sitting president of the United States, in my book, they lost all right to Section 230 immunity. And that, that's all I'll say on that. Thank you. Thank you. Erica. <clears throat> I would not support the repeal of Section 230. Uh, this is one of those topics that is not talked about honestly in either the left wing or the right wing media. The reality is section 230 was created to protect basically like internet providers, ISPs, okay? If we remove that, then Comcast is now gonna be responsible for everybody's, everybody's websites. And that's actually gonna create more problems with censorship because people are going to be responsible for what is on their platform. Uh, if we have a problem with the way that things are, what we need to do is things like antitrust lawsuits. If Facebook is too big and has too much power, antitrust lawsuit. Let's break up Instagram and Facebook. Uh, the neutrality is not written into Section 230. Neutrality is not required. It does not make anything a public square. 
we hear our, our Republican and conservative representatives say stuff like that, it is not true. They're misleading you about what Section 230 is because we're all mad about being shadow banned and, uh, and uh, discriminated against. So if we have a problem with some of these platforms doing point of view discrimination, we attack them directly. We have to do things like sue Amazon Web Services, right? Because they say, oh, you don't like being moderated on Twitter? Well, go build your own. Well, the problem is Amazon Web Services hosts 70% of websites, and they can cut you off from starting. You know, we saw that with Parler, Getter, all of these uh, uh, alternative websites were shut down from Stripe and Square and all and, and payment processors and things like that. Those places need to be sued. Okay. Oh, no, no warning. Sorry if I missed it. Uh, so Section 230 is uh, it just let's have an honest conversation. We cannot get rid of it. Thank you. Our final round of questions is on parental rights. Uh, beginning with the Senate, uh, Christina, you'll be going first. Do you think Attorney General Merrick Garland's memo, which announced that federal law enforcement would be involved in investigations pertaining to parents protesting local school boards, was acceptable? No. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, this memo was released, and it was billed as the administration's violent crime policy. Now, there were 21,500 homicides in the United States in 2020. That, that will be more in 2021. People are dying from violent crime, from shootings, and this is where the administration wants to put its focus. Um, it's really uh, dis very, very disturbing to me. As a former prosecutor, as a former U.S. attorney, we need to be focusing on real violent crime, gun crime, shootings, um, and, and using our gun laws to take guns out of the hands of criminals. Not on parents who are being involved in their children's education. And many of these parents, because their kids were stuck at home, and by the way, they were stuck at home for way too long, we gotta give them their childhood back. No more uh, going backwards installed in place. We've gotta manage life with the virus and move forward. They need to be in school without masks. But when they were stuck at home, parents uh, got a new window into what was happening in their, with their children and their children's education. And parents should be involved. Uh, not all parents will be good parents, but we want them to be good parents. And good parents should be involved in their children's lives, their education, and anything else that's going on with them. Um, this is just, this seems so s simple and common sense. We want parents involved in what's going on with their children, all the important aspects of their lives. But for this administration to make its violent crime policy turn around parents uh, showing up to school board meetings when people are being shot in cities across the country, um, you know, some areas, you know, children are, are in the line of fire. I, it's just appalling to me that this is where the administration is placing its focus. So that's a long way of saying no. Thank you. Gerald. Uh, <clears throat> No, uh, I do not, uh, and I did want to say thank heavens that A.G. Garland did not become a Supreme Court Justice. Mm. Uh, so I'm, I'm a parent, and my wife Stacy and I, we have four children, three in Vermont schools right now. Uh, I have spoken about my priorities, the first being to get back to abiding by the Constitution. In speaking about that, I've expressed that I will protect Americans from unconstitutional mandates, executive orders, and initiatives. This would be one of them. And I've also spoken about protecting parents' rights to decide about what is and what is not taught to, taught to their children, and I will, against acts like this. I've also noted against overspending, more taxes, more government, more control, being against all those. Uh, this initiative is exactly the more control I'm talking about. I support less government, uh, less control, just enough order to enable Americans to enjoy the liberty, rights, and freedoms from, that the Constitution provides. Uh, as I mentioned, I have four children, and I will stand up for the rights uh, for myself and parents to protest local school boards. Uh, this memo is an indication of just how far off track we've gone, and I will serve and fight to get us back on track, uh, back on track to parents having rights, not indoctrination on someone else's ideology. Thank you. Thank you. House candidates. Starting with 
Erica. Do you believe that CRT, uh, critical race theory, or similar philosophies are harmful to our students? If so, how do you propose that schools educate students on issues of race or gender? <clears throat> um, I believe that any sort of philosophy, uh, whether it's critical race theory or you know CRT adjacent, is incredibly harmful to our young people. Any notion that they are different because of their genitalia or the color of their skin or anything like that is, is really just is very sick. And it's turning people against each other from a very early age. This idea that we somehow have uh, that you know the f sins of the father that all white people carry with them is is incredibly uh, sick. It, it is very sick, and it and it actually demeans black people and anyone who is not white as if they are less than and not as good as they. It is it is put it is saying that they are only victims and the only thing that black people or not white people have contributed to this country is being slaves and being persecuted and discriminated against, which is a lie. It is not true. Uh, the reality is we have racists here and we have discrimination and there are areas of American life that do discriminate, industries that do discriminate against non-white people and that is true. But we diminish those conversations and we diminish the activism in those areas when we say that everything is racist. And we, we have this thing, have you guys heard of this term, learned helplessness, okay? We used to know what that was and they used to teach educators about that. That if you just teach people that it's hopeless and there's nothing they can do and, and everyone is against them, they don't try anymore, okay? People rise and fall to the level of expectation and our education system used to know that because my sister who's an educator told me that, okay? We need to teach people that we are all equal and that what matters is the content of your character, not your immutable characteristics. And uh, by the way, none of that, school has no place teaching any of that crap. That is, that is for you at home, that is for people elsewhere. Schools for reading, writing, and arithmetic, period. And history, maybe a couple of other ones. <laughs> Anya. So yes, CRT is harmful to children, and parents should be teaching about gender. Sexual education of elementary school students, and sometimes even younger, is not a school's place. Nobody should be talking to your child about sex at that age. I'm sorry, that's just a fact. And when I have children, I will not be sending them to public school to be learning that. We need to look at the fact that the school system has failed to turn out well-educated students for decades now. Yeah. They are not learning the basics. They are learning indoctrination. They are propagandized. They can repeat a liberal propaganda piece word for word, but they can't tell you who was president when or do simple math without a calculator. I hate to admit this, but I have a cousin who is, she's 14 years old, and she did not realize that 14 and 6 makes 20. She's now in you know special tutoring to, to correct this. She's 14. The school system has failed her on that level. And it's unfortunate that we have, that parents are now being treated as criminals for caring about what their children are learning, for standing up for their children. And in Washington, D.C., I will always advocate for a parent's right to protect their child, to be involved in their child's education. There needs to be transparency through the supervisory unions of the schools so that parents can view the curriculums and not be kept in the dark as they have been for so long. Unfortunately, in Orleans County, where I live, there is a big problem with CRT. Uh, we have talked to students. It's denied to our faces, but we have talked to the students who have told us the things that have gone on. and. The parents becoming involved in this is the first step to correcting it, and I am glad to see more and more parents becoming involved and caring about their child's education on the level that they need to be. It used to be you could send your child to school and you just really didn't have to worry that they weren't going to learn the basics, and that's not the case anymore. 
Thank you, Anya. Thank you. Now each candidate will have five minutes for a closing. Guy, I think we have we have time. We're ahead of schedule. I think we probably have time for one question from the audience. Okay, before the closing statements. Before the closing statements. Oh. So is there anybody from the audience who has a question that all four candidates <coughs> could answer? In the back, Deb. So because we're on the topic of education and children. Deb, can you come to the microphone here sure. so that you, it can be picked well, up? They didn't need a mic. Just oh, they, get, they've got them. Just get, we oh, can hear yeah. you yeah. fine. You're Deb back. Yeah. Well, it's not for the TV. It's, it's just the TV. Oh, right. thank you. Uh, because we're on the topic of children, um, I'm a big proponent of school choice. Of school choice, and how do we get there? Do you have any thoughts on that? Anyone want to take that question? I'm happy to start. I think uh, we need options for children who are trapped in failing schools, and this is one of those issues where you'll find Democrats agreeing with Republicans. Um, that, you know, especially um, in inner cities, uh, places like Washington, D.C., um, we need uh, children to have uh, the ability to have a good education. And so I'd be for promoting as much uh, public school choice um, in Vermont as possible. Um, and I'd be for um, uh, parents being able to uh, make a decision that got their children out of um, a failing school um, and into one that could serve them well. Uh, my mother and father elected to send me to Mater Christi and Rice, the Catholic schools here in Vermont. I am still a sinner. Um, <laughs> some of it didn't take uh, totally, but I uh, uh, got a great education at those schools. But it was a tremendous burden, particularly after my parents got divorced. It was it was a lot for my mom to both pay her taxes and pay the tuition. So I think we need to look at. Um, not only parental involvement, but making sure ch all children have access uh, to a good education. Anyone over here want to, want to handle that? I can. So school choice is very important. Um, I think that there needs to be a focus also on the persecution that religious schools face in this state and frankly around the nation. Uh, parents should have the opportunity to pick that school for their children without being penalized for it financially is, is the best way of saying it. There's school vouchers, there's all kinds of things that we can do. But school choice is very important because it goes back to parental involvement in education. And if you believe that your child will receive a better education from all of these different options, you should be able to do that. I'm also a big proponent of adding homeschooling into that. I am personally homeschooled. And I can tell you that I learned tremendous amounts of things just from reading books that would never have been allowed. I was grades ahead in reading. And my, my entire family is. My mother made the decision to homeschool all of her children. And it benefited us greatly. And I think that it's important to count homeschooling in school choice in the future. Thank you. Gerald, do you want to? Sure. Uh, I, I also am in favor of school choice, uh, so I'm a parent. My wife and I, Stacey and I, have four children. Uh, I think I mentioned three in Vermont schools. I can tell you just yesterday, uh, my wife and I crafted up an email to send to my youngest to his school and have him not participate in some, some of the education that they wanted him to participate in. So yes, school choice is important and having some options, uh, and including homeschooling. I can tell you, we, Last two years, my wife has uh, almost gone the homeschooling route uh, just because of the, how COVID's turned education upside down. So uh, I am in support of uh, school choice options. Thank you. Erica? Uh, I, I feel like a broken record. I also support school choice. Um, and I, I'll go even further and say that your tax, the tax dollars should follow the child, period. Um, particularly in Vermont, where so many schools are failing to have their students meet proficiency, they clearly cannot be trusted with the education of our children. Um, and this is gonna be very unpopular. I probably shouldn't say this in public, but I would also be for uh, breaking up the teachers' unions and taking away uh, uh, some of their power that they have. Um, the reality is I, I, I am anti-public sector union, period, okay? Private sector unions, I, that's a different conversation. But when you have a union that uses its resources to get 
people elected to office who they then negotiate their salaries and benefits and what they're allowed to do. Uh, ew, you know, that's a real problem for me. <clears throat> um, I don't even understand how that's legal, frankly. I think it should be illegal. Um, I would also, as your congressperson, work to remove the power of the uh, National Department of Education. Um, every educator that I know will tell you that no child left behind left every child behind. It has been an absolute nightmare. A lot of the, the really ugly stuff that we're seeing in our schools here in Vermont are actually mandated by the federal government. Um, so when I say I, wanna, I want to restore the federal government to the proper size, these are the kinds of things that I want to do. I want to see the Department of Education outside of the decisions that we make here. Um, I, there, there may have been a time when it made sense, you know, when we had segregated schools and there were things that, like civil rights issues that needed to be addressed, but that time in all reality has passed. And it's clear that whatever they wanted to do, they're failing at. So we need to take that money and take those resources away from them and give it back to the people who actually provide the service. Thank you. Thank you. So. Our closing statements, limit five minutes each. This will be your opportunity, candidates, to not only summarize, but also if you choose to address some of the comments made, uh, you, you may. Uh, we'll go from my left to right. Uh, Gerald, five minutes. Thank you, guys. So I'm running for United States Senator because the Democrat Party has failed our country. I am deeply concerned from, for the future of my four children and for Vermont and for America. We the people are in fact at a critical juncture and that's because the Democrat Party is leading us in the wrong direction, backwards, leading us so poorly that it actually seems like they are doing it on purpose. And frankly, I'm, I'm worried about how much longer we can keep going like this. We are running out of time and I'm going to be very straightforward here. I am all in to be part of the re Republican red wave that will regain control of the House and Senate and then the presidency and that will impl implement a unified Republican effort to get us back on track. That is the solution. Back to abiding by the Constitution, back to promoting the opportunity for economic prosperity for every American, and back to ensuring the defense, security, and order of our country. Stop overspending, less government, less taxation, more freedoms, not more control. I am in line with the Republican Party. That is, uh, that is what our, party need, our country needs right now, and I'm not gonna dilute the Republican Party effort. Here are a few things that you won't hear from me that are not part of my approach. Uh, that I am independent, that I'm bipartisan, that I'm, gonna, I'm willing to work across the aisle. Uh, you won't hear me say that I won't work for the Republican Party. Frankly, when I hear or read those things, I wonder, why not run as a, as a Democrat? You won't hear me uh, a few weeks from now with a new spin on what type of Republican I am. And you won't hear me waffle about being pro kind of pro-life. I am pro-life, period. Republican Party, sanctity of life. I mentioned speaking at Teen Challenge in Johnson. It was a great event. Candidates gave speeches, and then we had a prolonged Q&A. I wanted to share part of that panel as when we were asked random questions by the audience. Uh, one question was, and, and I am paraphrasing here, what local politician do you identify with, admire, uh, aspire to be like? I thought to myself, great, finally got a softball. My answer was Republican Representative Art Peterson. I said he is a good man and just wants to do what's best for Vermont. My opponent candidate said Senator Susan Collins. And in her speech, she also spoke about Senator Lisa Murkowski. Well, Senator Collins and Senator Murkowski are both pro-choice. And they both crossed the line and voted to impeach President Donald Trump. And they both crossed the line in favor of nominating the recent lifetime Supreme Court Justice nominee. I have voiced that I would not support that nomination based on character and qualifications. My opponent supported that nomination. I talked about the Democrat Party failing our nation. That failure includes putting us dangerously close to escalation. I say that because I served for three years in a nuclear-capable unit in Germany, working with NATO and defending the Fulda Gap against the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union as part of the Army's Third Armored Division. 
Not a single U.S. senator has boots on the ground nuclear experience with NATO in Europe. Not a single one. Not a single U.S. candidate senator also has boots on the ground experience in Korea and the other DMZ. I have both. Probably coming up on being about out of time, I would ask you, please, as I mentioned, take a look at web my website. You can learn a lot more about me. I don't have time to fit it in a into a short speech. I bring 42 years of experience, a breadth of experience. I offer my character, experience, leadership that our country needs, and performance. I'm seeking to be your next United States Senator as a Republican to get our country back on track. I want to say thank you to everyone for this great event. May the 14 stars shine bright. May God bless America. Thank you. Well, I think this is an incredibly hopeful time. Uh, like, like I started out saying, we've never had an opportunity like this before. We have an open United States Senate seat, and we must win it. We are not all going to agree on everything. No two people agree on absolutely everything, even in families. Sometimes families disagree uh, hugely. So we're not always going to agree on everything. Uh, but we need to elect someone who can make a change in Washington and get this country back on the right track. I've talked about my views when it comes to inflation, how we got to stop spending so much money, how we got to fund the police, how we have to secure the border and listen to Border Patrol to get it secured. Uh, we need to be strong on national defense and take care of our veterans. I believe in the Reagan motto of peace through strength. And I am an independent-minded Republican, and I'm not going to work for a party. And the people in politics, uh, in the establishment career elite politicians, they think they work for a party. Joe Biden thinks, or I'm sorry, Peter Welch thinks he works for Joe Biden. Uh, he doesn't. I'm going to work for you. And what I mean when I say that is, every decision I make will be with a servant's heart um, and thinking about what is best for my constituents and the people I'm in Washington to, ser to serve. And I think people in both parties have lost their way when it comes to that. They're not thinking about people. And that's what I mean when I say independent-minded Republican. It means I'm going to do the right thing. And I hope that should be what every uh, politician uh, strives to do. Um, bipartisanship is not a dirty word. As I mentioned, uh, there are 10 Democratic senators who are against lifting Title 42. We can come together around common sense policies. What has happened right now is this, everything has gotten so far off track uh, with the Biden agenda, with the far left Pelosi, defund the police, Welch agenda, um, that this has almost gone beyond, beyond politics. We need to come back to common sense. This shouldn't be difficult. See, uh, have a border. Every country needs a border, OK? Um, we, can ha we can get people, Democrats, independents, not the uh, progressives, maybe. Maybe they're too far afield. But we can get them to come together around these common sense ideas. Um, I am not for late-term abortion. I've been, if you go on and watch the, sa the same um, interview that uh, I said to go look on uh, on Twitter. I've been very consistent about this and you'll keep you'll hear me keep saying it. We have a constitutional amendment that is unconscionable uh, that is being proposed on the and it's going to be on the ballot this November um, to amend the Vermont Constitution to require abortion up to the moment of birth. Um, I am against that. I think Vermonters should retain the ability to restrict late term abortion. Um, and, you know, frankly, what else is this constitutional amendment, if it passes, going to allow? Will it allow partial birth abortion? I think so. We don't know what, what it's going to mean, but I'm uh, going to be voting no myself. I am against, I am for restrictions on late-term abortion, and I hope you'll go to the polls and vote against it, too. Um, yes, there were a number of senators. I actually mentioned them all um, in Lamoille County, uh, not just the ones he mentioned. but. Um, be that as it may, there were a number of senators uh, there to support me in Washington, D.C. last week. Uh, they, ha they were of all different views within the Republican Party. Um, and that just goes to show what a broad base of support I have. They came because they know I can win. They want me to win. And they said, Christina, we need help. We need help from New England. Help is on the way. Help is on the way. I am going to win this election. Um, and we are going to seize this moment, which is a unique moment in the history of Vermont. And help is going to be on the way. If you want hard work, common sense, and honor restored to Washington, we cannot elect a rubber stamp for the far left wing of the party. Peter Welch will vote with the far left wing on every issue. Um, and so I'm asking you, I'm asking Republicans, independents, and Democrats, Democrats especially, who, have, who feel their party has left them, and I've talked to so many 
who say, my party has left me. I'm going to be voting for you. We're going to win this election. It's an exciting time. Now is the moment. We cannot let this moment pass us by. So please honor me with your vote in August and November. And we're going to see the change that we're all so hungry for. Thank you so much. Thank you. There we go. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for investing your time and your energy and money into your own self-governance. That is what is at stake and at risk in this election. The federal government, our current officials, believe they know better how to live your life, to raise your children, what you should eat, listen to, what you're allowed to say. They believe that they know better than you do. And so this is an opportunity for you to say, no, in this country, we are self-governing. And I'm going to make my own choices, and you, the government, don't have a say. That's what electing a Republican will give, will help restore in this country. The red wave is real and it is absolutely accessible to us here in Vermont, no matter what anybody tells you. It is a matter of getting out the vote, letting people know that there are actual conservatives to vote for, okay? So that they'll get out to the polls and vote. So I, I love the question, what, uh, what Vermont uh, politician would you compare yourself to? And I would like to say I will be like Calvin Coolidge. He was a, he's a Vermonter and the only American president that the national debt did not grow under. Okay? He's my man. I have a portrait of him on my wall. Uh, my website, ericareddick.com. Everyone spells both my names wrong all of the time. Get a card. <laughs> Look it up. Hand it out to people. We have palm cards and other things that you can share with folks. I also have a podcast for folks who don't know. It's called Generally Irritable. Uh, yes. Because who isn't when they're talking about politics here? Let's be real. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be posting a video. I got to interview James Lindsay, who's here visiting. So I believe that's going to be posted tomorrow. Um, I don't have my normal live broadcast. Last Sunday, I had on Joe Sirio, who investigated the Russian mafia. So he was able to really give us a perspective on what's going on in Ukraine with the whole Ukraine-Russia situation. Um, I have been providing this service to Vermonters for a couple of years now because I believe education and knowledge is key in self-governance. If people don't know what's going on, they can't do anything about it. So sharing my message, sharing the podcast, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch, sharing it across with people. Let people know we exist. Uh, that is one of the biggest things that you can do. Go to ericaretic.com. You can donate online. There's an address at the bottom if you want to mail a check. Nobody likes to talk about money, but here's the reality. We can't win without resources. So everybody's paying five bucks a gallon. Heat, home heating oil's gone up, food's more expensive. Is, is it worth it to you to donate to my campaign so that we can end that suffering? How much is that worth to you? Go to ericareddick.com, make that choice for you and your family, and donate. That's what I'm asking for today. I'm also asking for your vote in August and in November. Uh, we, we need you guys. We need you to show up. The 50% of Vermonters or more who don't show up to the polls, you got to talk to them. Talk to your neighbors. Help us get the word out. Self-governance means we are responsible. So that's what I'm going to encourage you guys into. Um, I'm, I'm an accountant. I've been an accountant for much of the last 20 years. I am a small business consultant. I literally work with people across the spectrum. Every kind of business is dealing with the same problems, it's dealing with the same issues. Every single one of them I have been able to help bring them out of, an, of a situation where they didn't have information, they were hemorrhaging money, they're struggling to hire the right people. I literally help people for a living do what needs to be done in our country. Look at the data analyze it, make decisions, okay? You don't need me to, to be emotional, okay? You don't need me to give you hugs and kisses. You need me to be rational 
and logical, which we are sorely lacking in Washington. And I happen to, being, being an accountant, you kind of get that in spades. It's sort of annoying, actually. Your brain just is like constantly looking for problem solving. We need that when dealing with our foreign policy. We need that when dealing with the Fed and our monetary policy. We need reason and rationality more than anything in Washington right now. So again, my name is Erica Reddick. My website is ericareddick.com. My podcast is called Generally Irritable on Facebook and Twitch. And uh, sign my petition, please. Please sign my petition. Uh, it's on the table in the back. A book's for sale. Um, Take a look at the book. It's really funny. Thank you. Anya. First of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Wendy, for putting it together. And Guy, you did a wonderful job moderating. I appreciate your professionalism. We've heard a lot of opinions here today, and most of them ran to the same direction. We're all Republicans in this room, and so we don't really have any heated debate. So I'm going to tell you what I will bring to Washington for you. I bring professionalism, I bring honesty, I bring integrity, and I bring a work ethic that is unparalleled. I will be the person that stays up till 3 o'clock in the morning reading the bill and then voting on it at 8 a.m. the next day. I do that now, it's shocking. I can promise you this, I will be honest with you, I will place every vote that I make with your best interest in mind. I want to go and be the one to fight for you to fight for a better life for our children, to fight for the prosperity that this state can and should have. I know for a fact that when I go to Washington, D.C., I will make the connections necessary, that even in my first year, I've heard it said that you can't get anything done in Congress in your first year. I will get something done in Congress in my first year. I've never been in any job for a year that I didn't. I can promise you that. I want to do this for you and for because I believe in the principles of liberty. I believe that to defend freedom, we must have workers. Freedom is not something that we can have without the work being done, and I look forward to doing that work. I have a demonstrated history of standing up for the beliefs that we hold and being successful in implementing those beliefs. For example, in the platform committee, I stood up for the beliefs that we hold dear as a party, and we won in the platform committee at the convention, we won. That is what I will do for you in Washington. I will bring victories. I promise you victories. I'm going to go back to what I said in the beginning. Improvement over change. Change is inevitable. But it's only a good thing if we're going in a positive direction, if we're making a difference, if we're getting better instead of worse. And frankly, the Democrat Party has been leading us backwards for far too long. They are focused on the past, and they don't understand the future. And we as the Republicans do understand the future, and we can and will make a difference when the red wave happens this year. In order to do that, we do need to secure our elections, because I do believe that they will cheat to avoid having a red wave. And if you don't see one in November, that's what happened. I can promise you that. No citizen is not upset by what has happened. Nobody can afford the prices that they're paying. I stand for the Constitution. I stand for your rights as parents. I stand for lower, in, lower cost of living, lower inflation, less government spending, less government period. I don't believe in big government. The more government stays out of private enterprise, the better off we all are. I believe in agriculture and forestry is a tenet of our economy in Vermont and in our nation and the necessity for it to be secure national security wise we cannot be relying on foreign energy, foreign food, foreign medicine. That is unsafe for our people, and we need to make a change. I believe in border security. I will work to build the wall. I will not vote for H.R. 1 or the For the People Act, which is a power grab. The states have the right to hold their elections, and we need to preserve states' rights. You can go to my website, anyatinoforcongress.com. It has a whole lot more about where I stand on issues. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter as well. Um, many of you may have joined Twitter recently, I'm not sure. <laughs> and that being said, I just want to thank each of you for being invested in freedom. And I look forward to serving you in Washington. And I encourage you to reach out to me with any questions. And when I'm your representative, 
reach out to me then as well. I, I'll need to hear from a friendly voice every now and then because I'm sure the Democrats are going to contact me constantly to complain about me. <laughs> but I'm pro-life. I, I know that's important to many people in this room, but it's important to me as well. And I believe that we need to fight for religious liberty in our state and nation as well. I'm a Christian. I'm proud to say it. I brag on nothing but the Lord. And today, I just want to thank God that we're all here with the freedom to have this conversation because if it was up to the left, we would not. Mm -hmm. They would have silenced us completely, oppressed us completely, and we would have nothing left that they didn't want us to have. That is the tenets of communism, and unfortunately, it's on the rise, and we must stand up to shoot it down. Thank you all very much. I look forward to seeing you, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Have a great day. A round of applause for all the I'll use this so it can be recorded. Uh, first, I want to thank Guy Page. Guy, thank you for being our moderator today. And another round of applause for these candidates, because I'll tell you, in, in all my uh, years in politics, I I got to tell you, it's I, I want to compliment all four of you because I've never seen in our primary for a statewide office. Uh, such a talented group of people vying for these offices and all of you all of you any of you are way more talented than the people that you will be running you against did. in the general election so <laughs> and you know people talk a lot about democracy there's a lot of conversation about democracy right but this today is real democracy. So thank yourselves for being here. Yeah. This great, this was a great turnout. So happy everybody was here. And I do want to point out, you were left on your chair a little handout. The Chittenden County Republicans have basically derived a simple platform that we can share with our friends and neighbors because people wonder, well, you know, I think there's a lot of misinformation about what the party represents. You heard it today from these candidates. It reflects very well with this little piece. But I urge you to take this home, talk to your friends and neighbors about it, talk to them about this presentation today, and let's start getting the vote out. I think that's important. I think all of you have said, let's get more people voting, let's get people interested, let's educate them on the issues. And that is how we really help our friends and neighbors and our state in the long run become a better place. So thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your weekend.